Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Everybody, welcome back to the Pat Flynn Show. We have a returning guest, one of the original Sunday School guests. I am overjoyed to welcome back Dr. Robert Delfino. Thanks for joining me again. Oh, thanks for having me, Pat. Yeah, so we were trying to remember when our last conversation was. It had to be more than six months ago, but it was it was a great conversation. I recently went back and re-listened to it, and uh, it's always it's, first off, it's always painful for me to go back and re-listen <laughs> to my own my own voice. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's painful for me too. <laughs> but but you did a really nice job, and I really I really enjoyed um, re-listening to that. I thought it was a, a great conversation. We talked about all kinds of stuff. I mean, just just philosophy in general. And then we got into Thomas Aquinas and his fifth way. And I know we'll be exploring uh, more of that in this uh, conversation. But why don't we just take a few steps back? I'm sure there's uh, new listeners who, who may not be familiar with you and your work. Uh, so any type of introduction that you'd be willing to give us would be appreciated. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I teach uh, philosophy at St. John's University in New York. Mm -hmm. Uh, My specialty is metaphysics, and in particular, St. Thomas Aquinas, who obviously I'm a big fan of. Um, And I also teach in the summers uh, a graduate course at Holy Apostles College. It's it's, uh, called St. Thomas Aquinas on Being and Nothingness, which is basically a fancy name for uh, (laughs) metaphysics and natural theology. And in case the audience uh, isn't aware, metaphysics is the branch of philosophy that studies existence. Why do things exist? Uh, is there a God? Things like that. So it's, it's my favorite branch of philosophy, and it gets involved in all these interesting conversations about God. Mm-hmm. And it, it, I, I'm glad you made that clarification, because for whatever reason, the term metaphysics has, has somehow been hijacked. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? Where if you go into a bookstore and you kind of wander in, I don't know why you would do it, but if you wandered into the sort of new agey, <laughs> section you know i can't believe you did that pat because in the old days i used to make a joke that if you walked into walden books remember walden books yeah uh, i do have a section called metaphysics and it had all these you know astral projection and spirit that's books. it yeah that's right. <laughs> i was gonna say nobody walks in the bookstores anymore it's kindle it's amazon <laughs> but, but and i have no idea how that started but do you have any um theories on that and, and I, we obviously want to make it very you're not about to talk about ast- astral projections that's not, that's no, not, it's not going to be a new age talk at all it's, it's <laughs> about traditional metaphysics so what i think happened is well the word itself is probably part of the problem metaphysics so in the greek the word that we say for physics is phusis and it means nature uh, and na- nature has a few meanings, but the easiest thing to do is think of the physical world. I always think of a beautiful, lush rainforest. You know, it's nature. There's trees and birds and rivers and streams. And um, meta means, well, it can be translated in various ways, but it means above or beyond. So the metaphysical sounds like it's beyond the physical. And that would be the world of astral projection or souls or spirits and angels and things like that. But, you know, it also has a more... um, pedestrian history in the sense that some people think Aristotle's book, which was given the title Metaphysics, was simply because he didn't give it a title, and it was the sequel to his book, The Physics. So it could mean the book after The Physics. It could be that simple, although other scholars say, no, there's more to it. So I think that's part of the problem. Yeah, that makes sense to me. But so metaphysics is really a a kind of it's trying to look at the foundations, right? Uh, trying to probe the foundations of what, what, what is really going on, right? Yeah, so in, in traditional classical philosophy, think of the ancient Greek world and also the medieval world, there are two main kinds of sciences. There's the practical sciences and the theoretical sciences. The practical sciences are about giving you knowledge so that you can act better in the world. In many ways, some of what you do, because I know actually you're quite good at philosophy, Pat. 
Uh, some of what you do, though, is practical, right? You help people get into physical fitness because you have the knowledge so that they can train in the right way and do the right reps and do the right things and eat the right things so that they'll become healthier and stronger and, and better cardio and all that. So that would be knowledge for the sake of action, right? Mm -hmm. And in the classical world, there were three sciences for that. It was uh, economics, ethics, and politics. So economics literally means house rule, oikonomos. So it's about, you know, having the, the practical wisdom to make sure your house stays afloat and you have the right amount of food and your finances are good and all that. Ethics is about, you know, treating other people with correct conduct. Politics is about the good of the community. And then there are three theoretical sciences. The word theoria in the Greek means contemplation. So it's less about knowledge for the sake of action. It's more about knowledge for its own sake. It's about contemplating deep questions like, you know, what is the meaning of life? And, and uh, is there life after death? Is there a God, right? And those would be metaphysical questions. But the, the three theoretical sciences are mathematics, which is great, although in high school, nobody loves it. <laughs> Physics, <laughs> study of change and, and the processes in the natural world. Um, and then metaphysics, the study of existence, what exists. You could, and you can ask the question, do, do non-physical beings exist? And that would be sort of, you know, is there a God would be under that umbrella. So that's how it works with the, th with the different kinds of sciences. And that's how metaphysics fits in. That's good. That's a really nice, it's really nice to have those distinctions going into this conversation because I know sometimes uh, people can easily blur the lines. And I think that's where a lot of the conversations, especially conversations about God, get, get confused. Um, you know, so you hear these classic lines, well, you know, hey, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's just no evidence for God. That's, that's one of those common cliches you hear. Those people have a very narrow understanding of what would constitute evidence. You know, yeah. It only can be in the laboratory or some kind of scientific evidence. That's it. And what you're kind of saying is there's a fundamental category mistake going in there. If, if you conceive of God as just some being in the physical universe, then, then, then sure, fair enough. Your God is not probably going to be found under a microscope or through a telescope. There's no empirical test you can run that's going to just turn up God. I actually had someone email me and say that, well, we've used radar and we, we can't find heaven. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good um, I haven't heard that one before. Yeah, I didn't know what to do. I, I, part of me wanted to laugh. I mean, this is over email, so it's not like it's on a phone conversation. Another part of me wanted to do like a facepalm, like what's happened to my culture? Like, obviously, you're not going to find heaven with radar. <laughs> the angels don't show up on radar, but what can you do? <laughs> yeah, maybe we can talk about angels a little bit as we move along here. But let's, let's, let's go in the direction we, we had planned. Um, Thomas Aquinas. So before I was Catholic, before I was into all this stuff, I never... I would be curious what you would have would have said to me at, at this time, Dr. Delfino, because I had this, we actually talked about this a little bit last time, this sort of chronological snobbery or, or condescension where I would hear of people like Aquinas or even Aristotle. I'd be like, you know, they're old. Haven't they all been debunked? Like, you know, like good for them. They did the best they could at the time, but you know, it's, we had the enlightenment and, and now we just know it was sort of my general attitude. And obviously I think I was, I was deeply wrong um, and confused at that time, but that was, that was the attitude that, that I carried around when it came to people, you know, before a certain age, what would be your first general remark about that? And, and why is somebody like Aquinas still as important and relevant today? And who was he? First off, <laughs> who was this guy? <laughs> Ah, okay. So Aquinas was a 13th century. He died in 1274. Mm -hmm. Dominican friar. Okay. So he, he, he was a priest, uh, but they were an order of mendicant, mendicants. They were, they were beggars and they had to take vows of uh, obedience, chastity, and poverty. And uh, he was also a theologian and university professor. And today he's a saint and doctor of the church. So um, the Dominicans were founded in 1216 by St. Dominic, of course, and it was actually to fight heresy. So they're known as the Order of the Preachers, and, and, and the, the rationale for the existence, or the raison d'etre for the existence of uh, the Dominicans is to teach, to clarify, to get rid of error. So they're a very intellectual order. Mm -hmm. they're, uh, they're challengers, if you will. It's kind of like, you know, there's always a one upsmanship would be the Jesuits, right? 
but uh, I'm, I'm more of a Dominican guy myself. Uh, <laughs> if you look at the history of philosophy, Jesuits have ruined so many people like Descartes and, and James Joyce. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, it's, it's so funny. So my friend Robert Spitzer, he's obviously a, a Jesuit too. Well, he's so one it, of the good ones though. <laughs> he, he is one of the good ones. Um, he, he's been on a number of times. So it is funny to see how that intellectual battle within the Catholic Church yet rages to this day, huh? <laughs> right. So, uh, so, yeah, so basically Thomas was, was, was a very intellectual preaching, teaching kind of guy. He was a university professor, like I said. Uh, and, he, and he obviously was, was very, very gifted. I mean, um, I, I think uh, Pope Leo XIII declared him the patron saint of universities throughout the world. So he, he, was, he was great intellect. Now, you asked me about this whole view that, well, you know, those guys were good, but we have science now, and that stuff's been debunked, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like specifically his, his five ways. Like, you know, people would, would bring it up to me like, hey, have you ever read Aquinas or heard of his, his five ways and his arguments for God? And, and my general thing, well, first off, no, I hadn't. But my general thing was to sort of just give a hand-waving dismissal. Ah, you know, all that stuff. It's, it's been debunked, haven't you heard? Now, how it's been debunked, I couldn't have ever explained it, <laughs> as it just so happens. But that, would, that was my general attitude. So let me, yeah, let me make a few comments about that. There's two things going on here, I think. Number one, I mean, yes, some of the things that Thomas says, for example, he talks about human reproduction, right? They didn't exactly know about sperm cells, but they knew, you know, about semen, of course. And they didn't know about egg cells. They would talk about menstrual blood, catamenia in the Greek. Um, So when Thomas talks about human reproduction, um, you know, his his biology is is not good. I mean, the discoveries we've made since him, you know, in a way show how, he wasn't working in a really good framework. So yes, are there things in Thomas that have been superseded by science? Of course, but that's not the issue. The issue is just because some things in him have been uh, superseded doesn't mean everything has. And also there's a category mistake I would say some people are making here. For example, when Thomas Aquinas talks about ethics, good and evil, right and wrong, or when he talks about existence, why do things exist or not? That's not something that modern science, which relies on hypothesis and experimentation, could ever debunk. You can't study existence in a lab. It's not the kind of thing that uh, is amenable to scientific experimentation. Similarly, good and evil questions about ethics are not something you can resolve through a laboratory experiment or any kind of scientific experiment. So to the extent that he's talking about things that are outside of the natural physical sciences, and to the extent that he talks about them well they have lasting value they're not going to be debunked yeah so and this was that was what i eventually came to realize is that you know okay you know he may have been off on the particulars of you know some of his physical theories some of his biological theories but his metaphysical lines of thought right of act and potency of what changes of existence um, well, science has to presuppose all of that stuff to a certain extent. So you, you have to kind of roll up your sleeves and, and look at, well, you have to separate the physics from, from the metaphysics again. And, just, and same thing with Aristotle, just because Aristotle was off on some of his biology doesn't mean that he was necessarily off on his metaphysics. Now, maybe he was, but you just you, you can't carry that argument through from physics to metaphysics is, is what you're saying, right? That's right. It doesn't logically follow that... Uh just because Aquinas or Aristotle are wrong about certain things, perhaps in biology or something like that, that what they say in ethics or metaphysics is totally wrong. Then that, that, does, that, that argument doesn't logically follow. Now, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but I just finished um, Ed Fazer's book, um, Aristotle's Revenge. Have you poked through that one yet? I bought that one, but I haven't gotten a chance to uh, read it yet. So how do you like it? I, I mean, I loved it. I thought it was great. And uh, it's, what's, what's the gist of the revenge? Is it about the sciences or about something else? It is. It's philosophy of nature. So he deals with philosophy of science in there, and he's just he's just showing how the the, the metaphysics, classic metaphysics of, of Aquinas, really is presupposed by the the sciences of of the modern day, and how the how how this way of looking at the world is not only just as relevant, but you know, necessary today substance accidents actuality potentiality all that so very dense very technical but but i thought it was really good yeah can i say something about that so another name for metaphysics is actually first philosophy like i said earlier aristotle didn't actually give his book the title metaphysics that was given by an editor but he did call metaphysics wisdom he called it theology he actually uses that word in the greek and he also called it first philosophy 
And first philosophy means that it's the most foundational. It's, it's like the bedrock. It's the deepest branch of philosophy. And that's, and that's one way in which it is presupposed by everything, including the modern sciences that we love, like physics and chemistry. So for, I'll give you an easy example for this. If you're a physicist or if you're a chemist, right, and you're trying to synthesize some chemical or something like that, you want to find the correct way of doing it. You want to be able to say to your audiences or in your journal that, look, no, this is true. You can synthesize this chemical if you do A, B, and C in the lab, and then you'll get the chemical. You, you, you want truth in science. I mean, it's not always easy to prove something definitively true because sometimes theories are partially true, and then we realize later on they're a little flawed. But we're, we're, we're aiming for truth. Now, truth is not something that can be investigated by the natural sciences themselves. What is truth is something that's a topic in metaphysics. So the sciences presuppose things like truth and cause, which have to be talked about in a higher different science, metaphysics. So mm. it, metaphysics is actually inescapable because it's about the most foundational things in the universe. It's about being, it's about existence, it's about actuality and potentiality, it's about truth and cause. And all the other disciplines generally rely on those things, at least to some extent. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we brought this up because I, I, these are, I think, often common stumbling points for people that, that don't have to be. Um, so it's, it's good as a preface to what we're going to get into. So back to Aquinas, um, his five ways. What, what's, let's start there because he is you know, famously known whether people think that um, these arguments succeed or not for presenting these, these five arguments for the existence of God. So what background can you give us on where Aquinas is coming from with these arguments. And then I know we're going to spend time on, on one of them specifically, but anything that we should know before having that conversation. <clears throat> Excuse me for a second. Um, so one of the great things about Aquinas is he had a great respect for the thinkers who came prior to him. And he's often very charitable. Sometimes I think a little too charitable uh, in his reading of them. And he's also very humble uh, too in the sense that he gives them a lot of credit. So the five ways are, in some ways, are not his own arguments. The first, second, and fourth way, some version of it, can be found in Aristotle. And the third and fifth way can be found in some Islamic thinkers. So, for example, the uh, third way, which we're going to talk about today, um, has its origins in Ibn Sina, famous mm -hmm. Islamic theologian, also known as Avicenna in the West. And the fifth way, which I did with you last time, has its origins in Ibn Rushdi, another Islamic thinker, but also in a Christian, John Damascene. So in many ways, Aquinas is a great synthesizer of past thought. But here's the thing that most people miss. Um, it's not that he just rehashed the, these five arguments from earlier people. No. He, he revises them or ups, updates them in light of his teachings on existence. That's the great revolution in Aquinas. If you actually look at the history of philosophy, there's a three-step progression. So the earliest philosophers, the ones prior to Socrates, they're called the pre-Socratics. Mm -hmm. uh, they really don't get much beyond the notion of matter, the physical world, what you can see and touch with your hands and see with your eyes. Um, so a lot of their uh, thought is, is often characterized as materialist thought. But then later in the history of philosophy, a big step up is made. Plato comes up with a genuine non-physical or incorporeal notion in philosophy, right? He talks about these forms. Forms are not matter. But, and, and they exist in this realm, which is non-physical. And Plato claims that, you know, he died and he was there. Now he's reincarnated. Now, all those little details aren't important. The point is, he, philosophically, he arrived at a notion that there's more to the universe than just matter, mm -hmm. non-material, right? And this non-material stuff, stuff isn't grasped in, with the senses. Like with, with physical matter, you look at it with your eyes and the optic nerve, and you can touch it and grab it. And if it's a hamburger, you can eat it, unless you're on a diet. Uh, <laughs> but with the, uh, with the non-physical forms, you have to contemplate them in your mind through concepts, right? So we're going from senses to concepts, we're going from the material to the non-material. But then there's a third stage in the history of philosophy. And this is where I think Aquinas makes the best contribution. He brings the plane now to existence. So 
what's happening here is, you know, think about when you meet your friend for lunch, right? You might see with your eyes that they're wearing a green shirt. Like, oh, okay. And uh, you might look at the shirt and notice that, oh, there, there's a, you know, there's a lion on that shirt, right? That's conceptual now because, you, you know, it's, it certainly has an image and a color and a shape, but you know it's a lion based on the shape. And of course, you've seen lions before and intellectually you realize that they're a, you know, they're a kind of cat and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So you see the green shirt with your eyes, you abstract that it's a lion with your intellect conceptually. But you also know your friend exists, that he's present there before you, that he's in the room. That's known through a different act of the mind. That's known as the act of judgment, as we Thomas Aquinas scholars say, right? It's your awareness that something exists. To give your audience a little insight into this, if you've ever had a dream, let me, let me ask you, have you ever had a dream and in the middle of the dream, you realized it was a dream? Have you ever oh, had I, I have that all the time. And sometimes they <laughs> turn someone into nightmares where I try to wake myself up. <laughs> Okay, so listen, that's important. That, that shows you how we have this, this other act of the mind. In, in addition to sensing with our sense organs, in addition to abstracting concepts with our intellect, we also have an awareness known as judgment that something exists, either mental existence like a dream or, or physical existence. So for example, when, when you're having the dream and you realize in the middle, wait a minute, this is not the real world. Mm -hmm. I'm dreaming. You're making the judgment that that's a mental kind of existence. It's not mm -hmm. a real existence right so aquinas's great contribution is to realize that actuality in its pure uh, pure sense is not form as aristotle would say but existence so let me i know that might sound a little obscure so let me tell your audience this you know what's the moment when a guy first becomes a father or a dad well it has to be the moment when his children begin to exist, right? Because prior to their existence, he's not a dad. Mm -hmm. He's either married without children or a bachelor. It's only when his children begin to exist that he is now actually a dad or a father. So something isn't actual if it doesn't have existence. And that's the keen insight for Aquinas, that there's a connection between existence and actuality. And he's going to interpret the five ways in light of existence. Whereas Aristotle, for example, would interpret the, 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 the three of the ways he gave in, in terms of form. Mm. But that's a very big difference. So actually, Aquinas' five ways are not really just rehashing the others. I think he's updating them in light of existence, and he's making them more powerful. And we're going to see that when we talk about the third way. Yeah, that's good, because I think for people who might be – a little unsure of what's being said. I think this will make a lot more sense as we, as we dive into this. So I invited you on to talk about the third way specifically, and I would love to obviously talk to you about all of them, but we have to focus on at least one. Um, so unless there's anything else you want to say, should we dive right into what this, this third way is? Sure. We can um, dive yeah, let's go into it. So he's got, he's got five arguments, right? He's got five ways that he believes God's existence can be demonstrated. First off, I hate to do even more prefatory work, but what does he mean by demonstrated? I think even that is kind of important to get clear on. What does he mean that, that we can know of God's existence through a metaphysical demonstration? What, what, what is that telling us? Right. Now, this highlights the difference between the methods of philosophy versus the methods of the natural sciences like chemistry and biology. So mm -hmm. real quickly, in the, in the modern sciences, you, know, you, you have a hypothesis and then you want to test it. So you develop some kind of experiment. To see, you know, go something like this. Well, if my hypothesis is true, then if I do A, B, and C, you know, X should happen. Mm -hmm. so you perform the experiment and you see if, if X happened. And if X happened, the hypothesis is confirmed. That doesn't necessarily mean it's true, but it's certainly supportive of that. And if X doesn't happen as a result of the experiment, we say the hypothesis is disconfirmed. Mm -hmm. Some people in the history of philosophy want to immediately move to say, oh, it's false, the hypothesis, because we didn't get what we wanted. But many other philosophers of science have pointed out how you can't be that quick and hasty. Maybe there's another reason why you didn't get what you wanted. Maybe something was interfering in the test. Now, I mention all of this to show you that the kind of certainty that we can have through the scientific method of experimentation is not that strong. It's not bad, but it's, it's not definitive. Mm -hmm. However, in sciences like mathematics, or I would argue in metaphysics, you can have a stronger, more definitive certainty to the conclusions. And that's why we call it demonstration. 
Mm. Demonstration comes from the Latin verb demonstrare, which means to show, to prove. Uh, and in, I'll give you uh, mathematical examples are, are always uh, easier in some ways. But in mathematics, sometimes you assume the opposite of what you want to prove. And then when you assume the opposite and it leads to a contradiction, an absurdity, you realize that the opposite of what you wanted to prove is false. And therefore, what you want, therefore the opposite of that is true. So mm-hmm. you directly get to it. In philosophy, it's a little maybe easier to conceptualize. A demonstration is an argument with premises, steps, and if all of the steps are true, none of them are factually false. You know, you're not giving any false information. If all the steps are true and if the conclusion is implied by those steps, well, then it's impossible for the conclusion to be false. Another way of putting this is if the conclusion is valid and all the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. So that would be a demonstration. Very good. So again, a little expectations therapy going on for people that if, if you're kind of in that mode of scientism, not only hey, listen, is... Yep. To, uh, no, I was going to say to your audience, I know this is difficult stuff. Philosophy takes many years to do well. It's kind of like martial arts in a way. Nobody becomes a black belt overnight. But if you stick with it, you can grow with it and, and it gets good. Mm-hmm. But But what you're saying is that to the extent these metaphysical demonstrations succeed, they actually give us a very secure grip a very definitive knowledge of their conclusion and an even even more definitive knowledge or an even firmer grip than even the physical sciences can give us. Yeah, I think that's true, although there's a few little caveats. I won't get into it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because, I mean, maybe, maybe some of the premises are wrong. So, it, and among well, other things. The mm-hmm. thing is that the, in the natural sciences, you're dealing with things often that you can see, like if you're studying dogs, those are very clear. In the case of God, for example, though, I do think you can get to definitive certitude about certain things, but it's always going to be somewhat obscure because you never actually see the, the, the being that you demonstrate, not, at least not with your eyes, of course, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And that's there's some caveats. Cool. The third way. What's Aquinas trying to teach us and how do oh, you present it? <laughs> third way is my absolute favorite of the five ways. And the reason for that is it's squarely on existence. And so in that sense, I think it really highlights, uh, I mean, the others all involve existence too, but this one is, it's just, it's screaming with existence everywhere. So let me talk. (laughs) Please do. (laughs) It's about whether or not there's a necessary being. Let me just say a little something about that. You know, in philosophy, we often try to form Uh, definitions or descriptions of things as a preliminary to get to talk about them. So, for example, a lot of my students like these zombie movies or The Walking Dead, or they like vampires because there's all these, you know, movies and TV shows. And Mm -hmm. if you want to actually have a discussion about vampires or zombies, you know, we, we actually have to try to define our terms as best as possible, or at least describe them. You know, a zombie is something that actually is not alive. It died, but it can somehow walk and attack you and all that. Mm -hmm. And vampires are also not alive, although they can move and suck your blood. And if you put a crucifix in front of them, they explode or they, or they, they shriek in horror. So, (laughs) you know, we need some kind of description. So I'm not claiming, of course, that vampires or zombies exist when I give a definition or a description, but I'm just saying, look, we need some way of talking about it. Mm -hmm. So the only preliminary, there's just three little things I want to do as a preliminary to the third way. It's talk about possible beings. Although I think I'm going to use the word contingent beings today. That seems to be more common. So contingent beings, necessary beings, and what does it mean to be caused? Mm -hmm. So let me go with that. So a necessary being, just as a, on the definitional stage, would be something for which it is impossible for it not to exist. Now, we don't know if there are any necessary beings, um, but that would be the definition. A possible being, this is Thomas Aquinas' terminology. He says that it, it's something for which it is possible to exist, but it also could not, it also is capable of not existing. Let's put it that way, right? Um, and for this, I like to use the example of myself or, or the audience member can use their own self, mm-hmm. right? Imagine, Pat, if your parents never met, you wouldn't exist, right? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Wanted to get you in here a little. Yeah. So, uh, exactly. If my parents never met, I wouldn't exist. 
I mean, maybe uh, they would have, you know, my parents would have met other people and had other children. Okay. But certainly I wouldn't be here. So I'm a possible being, or as more common nowadays, I'm a contingent being. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a time when I didn't exist before my parents met. And of course, I do exist now, but I won't exist forever. Everybody gets old and dies unless you're married and you're assumed into heaven. But we don't, most of us don't have that luxury, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what it means to be a contingent being. Something that's capable of existing, but it doesn't have to. And also it's capable of non-existing. Now that brings me to the last little pre preliminary thing I want to do, causation. A lot of people will say, well, what does Thomas Aquinas mean by cause and all of this stuff he says? So the easiest way to think of cause is existential dependence, that something is dependent on something else for its existence. I, in some sense, was dependent on my parents for my existence, because if they didn't meet, I wouldn't exist. All right. So that's all you need to know to get the third way started. Cool. All right. You ready for stage one? Yeah, I think I'm ready. I'm going to give you some space. So take as much time as you need. All right, I'm going to go through about five stages, but I'm going to do stage one first, and then you can ask me some questions and raise some objections, however you feel. Perfect. All right, so stage one of the third way, and I'm going to lay it out the way I think it's easiest, because Thomas just gives you a short little paragraph, and I'm not going to read that. I'm just going to lay out the, the gist of what he gives there, but in a way I think is easier to understand. So in stage one, all we want to accomplish is we want to realize and know that in the world, there are at least some things that have existence contingently. They don't have it necessarily. Now, how do we know that some beings in the world have existence contingently? Well, actually, it's not too hard. It's because we realize that some of them are generated and some of them corrupt. Now, that's the philosophical lingo. But basically, a new baby is born, that's generation, and an old man dies he passes away that's corruption mm -hmm. and the idea is that you a human being if he passes away he no longer exists yes i know there's a body that decomposes but the point is your friend is gone and when a new baby comes into the world something that didn't exist before is now here and it keeps you up at three in the morning you have four kids right <laughs> or coming, coming? Yeah, yeah i will i will have four in october god willing. okay congratulations mm -hmm. thank you so uh yeah, I mean, you know how it is. The sleep sleep dies when the baby is born. <laughs> if, if I have trouble forming sentences on this conversation, it's because I experienced that last night. <laughs> well, actually, my six and a half year old and my uh, my five year old were terrible last night. It took a long time for them to get to bed, but they finally did. Yeah, it's always it's always great when your 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 kid is you know up through most of the night, you know, kicking you in the bed, and it's, and it, and you have to have a heavy philosophical conversation the next morning with Doctor Delfino. <laughs> You can't yeah, even think straight. You're the nice guy. After a while, I just lose it and say, all right, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> anyways, anyways, I get it. Yes. <laughs> right. So we want to establish that some things in the world have existence contingently, not necessarily, but contingent. And we, and we, and we can know that. Hold on. Hold on one second. I needed a drink of water. Mm -hmm. We can know that because we realize that some of them passed away and they lose their existence and some of them gain existence, right? So uh, it's possible for them to exist and it's also possible for them not to exist. Mm -hmm. Now I want to focus, because this is the right way to grasp the third way. I want to focus on coming into existence, right? And the nice image to keep in your mind is yourself. If your parents never met, you would not exist, right? So a contingent being always relies on a cause or causes, multiple causes, outside of it just like I relied on my parents to bring me into this world, right? Mm -hmm. And if my parents didn't meet, I wouldn't exist. So what I want to get across to your audience is two things right now. One, we certainly know that some things in, in the universe have existence contingently because they come into being and some of them pass out of being. And we realize that these contingent beings are always dependent on some cause outside of them. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist. Does that make clear? That so clear? far, so good. Okay. All right. So every contingent being points to a cause outside of itself. Now we move to stage two. All right. Now this is a thought experiment stage. Philosophers don't get a lot of funding. We don't have big labs and particle accelerators. So we got to do these thought experiments. So you just, you just get a big comfy armchair, right? That's your lab. 
Oh, man, that's one of those stereotypes, armchair thinkers. When I talk with biologists, they're like, oh, you're one of those armchair people. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like saying, like, yeah, well, you get all the funding, and what are they going to do? Are they gonna take away my chalk? Is that how they're going to reduce my funding? Right. <laughs> so uh, here's the thought experiment. We, we realized in stage one that there are some contingent beings in the universe, maybe not all of them, but there are at least some. And then the thought experiment is, could it be the case that everything in reality, everything in the universe, every particle of dust, every planet, everything is a contingent being, that there are no necessary beings? And we realize, once we think about it, and I'll take you through this step by step, the answer is no. It's impossible that reality is just composed of contingent beings and nothing else. Mm -hmm. Now, the easiest way to grasp this is to make the um, example simple. I mean, I can't, I can barely hold, you know, 10 things in my mind. I'm not going to imagine a world with a million or a billion contingent beings. No, that, that's going to give me a headache. So let's just all together try to imagine a universe where the only thing that exists in this universe is one contingent being. That's it. There's nothing else. It's a universe, which is one contingent being. Is that kind of a universe possible? Could that kind of universe exist? And the answer is no. Now, your audience is probably like, well, why, Delfino? Why can't it exist? Okay, well, earlier we agreed that a contingent being always points outside of itself to a cause on which it is dependent for its existence. I would not be here if my parents never met. Well, in a universe with only one contingent being, there is nothing outside of itself. So that's a real problem, right? Yeah, so, so you're saying if, if, if the totality of, of reality were just one thing, say an ostrich egg. Um, no, no, that's, that's even too much because the ostrich egg is made up of electrons and protons. Just imagine the universe with one simple contingent being and nothing else. And that's it. Um, that's- but, but that contingent being can only be there if there are, is some type of prior condition for its existence. But this is, this is the only thing that's in reality. So there can be nothing, there can right. be no prior condition for its existence. Therefore, it would, it would not exist. Exactly. There's, we've already established that every contingent being is dependent on a cause outside of itself for its existence. But in a world where only one contingent being exists, there is nothing outside of itself. And so there, there would be no way to explain how it, it got existence. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a few other moves that could be made, and I'm going to go through them now, but they all, they all end in, in, in disaster for the, the objector or the skeptic. So, for example, you can't say that this one contingent being caused its own existence. There, there's two problems here. One, that we've already established that it, to be a contingent being is to be dependent on something else, not yourself. But even if we put that aside, a contingent being can't cause its own existence because to act as a cause, you already have to exist. But if you already exist, well, then you don't need to give yourself existence or cause your own existence, right? Mm-hmm. So, so that's out. Now, some people might get clever and say, well, maybe from the nothingness, this contingent being pops out. Well, there's a problem here. <laughs> we're, call- we're calling that clever now, huh? <laughs> uh, well, you know, Lawrence Krauss wrote a book called The Universe from Nothing, where he thought he was clever, but a lot of scientists t- and philosophers took him to task. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm familiar, yeah. Uh-huh. Right, right, right. So the problem with saying that nothingness causes the contingent being is, well, nothingness has nothing. It has no zero causal power. So if, if it has zero causal power, how could it cause this contingent being? It can't. Now, if you say that it does have some causal power, well, then it's not nothing anymore. It would be something. And now we're getting ridiculous, right? So, so I want to pause right here because this is a comment. I just had a conversation with somebody about this the, the other day. And I think it brings up the necessity of why we had to make those distinctions at the beginning of our chat between metaphysics and physics. Um, because even when it comes to the idea of contingency, the, the idea here or the, or the objection was that this is just a fallacy of composition in the sense that, well, look, just because most of the things that we experience that are contingent have some prior condition to explain them. That doesn't mean that everything does, but that, but that is implying that, that we get our causal principle from an inductive generalization, which we absolutely don't. It's, it's, a, it's a metaphysical principle 
So maybe you could uh, expand upon that and, and talk about how this is actually not a fallacy of composition that we're working from. Hmm. So I guess your point is saying that, uh, well, I think the objector is saying that, uh, it, like you're right, if we're relying on induction, there's no uh, necessity here. But I mean, the way I, w- I, w- I would respond to this person is say, look, this, this is not a matter of um, simple logic in, in the sense that, think about it. Unless you're going to say something can come from nothing, we absolutely need a cause. So it, there's no other way for a contingent being to come in unless there's some kind of cause, which means some kind of being. <laughs> just, there's no other chess move available. Huh. Uh, you know, so it's, it's something that we, we, we abstract out from the universe. It's not something that we, we arrive at inductively, like you said. Yeah, so it's, it's not that just, first off, we don't have any exceptions to it, even if we were looking at it inductively. Um, but it's, it's not like the reason we think that contingent things have a cause is because we've run enough experiments and it seems to, to yield a certain degree of, of predictive success. The reason we think it is because, well, what's the alternative? The alternative is that it doesn't have a cause and it comes from nothing. And that's clearly absurd and we well, can't accept the absurdity. So, so therefore <laughs> this is our only other option. That's why it's a, it's a, it's, it's something that again, science presupposes it's a deeper level of knowledge. So I know it's right. actually it's, if we didn't presuppose this, science could turn into magic. Because if we say things like, well, you don't need a cause uh, for things to come into being or for things to happen, well, now, now you've basically destroyed science in a way because science is all about discovering cause effect relationships. And if you suddenly say, well, we don't need a cause, things can spring into being from nothing. Well, now you've destroyed science because, you know, why do we need a cause for cancer then? Why do we need a cause for babies? We can say, oh, it just happens, you know. Yeah, or why, why do we need the theory of evolution? Humans just uh, spontaneously came into being from sponge cake. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, yeah. I don't think that that is a move that, that uh, the skeptics should make, but it's amazing how many skeptics do make that move, and I don't think that it's... It, it's well, there's big. historical reasons. I think that, that they're hung up on epistemology, the study of knowledge, uh-huh. when they really be focusing on, on being and that there's just no other part. Like you said, it's either absurdity or there has to be a cause. There, there really is no middle ground. And they want to say, well, we can't know, see, epistemologically, we can't know based on induction about this. Yeah, yeah, but that doesn't matter. Maybe you can know through another way by realizing it's either absurdity or, or being. There's no middle ground. Yeah. I'm sorry to get so nitpicky at the beginning here, but I just had this conversation, so I thought oh, it was This relevant. is good. I have to say, Pat, you know, <laughs> sometimes, uh, I, I, this is the second time you've interviewed me, and it's great because – there are little nuances to things that I wouldn't, ways I wouldn't exactly put it that make me think in new directions. So thank you for helping me to, you know, refine this even further. So that's good. Oh, well, man. I mean, you're the one helping me here. So. <laughs> no, it's All um, right. So yeah, cool. Let's continue on. Yep. So I'm going to just br- briefly go over the last three reasons. Uh, so we, we, we were trying to imagine if it's possible for there to be a universe an actual universe that exists where the only thing that exists in the universe is one single solitary contingent being. And we're starting to realize that this is impossible because one, our prior argumentation showed that a contingent being or a possible being always points outside of itself to a cause. Uh, But in a universe of just one contingent being, there is nothing else outside of it. So that's a problem. We realized it can't cause its own existence because to act as a cause of itself, it would already have to exist to cause itself, but then it doesn't need to cause itself. And then we realize that nothingness, emptiness, whatever phrase you want to use or word you want to use, nothingness has no causal power. So it can't make or produce this one contingent being. Now, if we add in a second contingent being, because it's kind of a lonely world right now. It's only got one thing in it. Suppose we give it a partner, right? Uh, so now there's two contingent beings in this little thought experiment universe. Does that help? No, because every time we add a new contingent being, it too points outside of itself on something that it's dependent for its existence. So that's not going to help. Even if we add a million of them, they all point outside of itself. So the way to grasp this, this is interesting now. So let's talk about A and B in this little world, right? A is a contingent being and B is a contingent being and nothing else exists, right? Okay. Okay. Well, you could say that B was caused by A in this little world, uh, and that would explain why B is around, but we still wouldn't know what caused A, right? Now, some people might try to be clever, and they say, wait a minute, I got it. In this little world of two contingent beings, A and B, we could say this. We could say A causes B, and B 
causes A, and then everything has a cause, and we're good to go. Just now go I can a circle. <laughs> well, there you go. It's a circular <laughs> argument. Now, the way I like to explain this to my students that it's a problem is you got to think back to the old days when cars were simple. You needed a key to open the door, and that was it, right? Uh, now we have OnStar and all these other things. And people can remotely unlock your car, but forget about all that stuff. Imagine if in the 1950s, you locked your keys in the car. Well, you need to open the door to get your keys, but you need your keys to open the door. This is an, a, a vicious circle that's irresolvable. You're either going to have to break the window to resolve it, or you're going to have to call a mechanic who can jimmy out the lock or something. I don't know. But the point is we have a vicious cir circularity and it doesn't work. So after all this argumentation, we realize it is impossible to have a world that only has one contingent being that cannot, that such world cannot exist. Any questions at the end of this stage? Yeah, no, I just want to say that, yeah, I've, I've heard the kind of circular causality, ca causality thing. And uh, actually our, our friend, we brought him up before Robert Spitzer has a really good response to this is that, you know, if it's a finite kind of thing where they're going back and forth, causing each other, you're going to have to have some terminating condition. And then if that's contingent and there's nothing to explain it, then poof, the whole series goes out. If it's infinite, if it just goes around forever, then we're talking about there's a series of conditions that's always one plus more than can ever be achieved since that's what affinity means. Therefore, this, this circular causation is relying on a set of conditions that's always plus one more than can ever be reached, and it would never have began to exist in the first place. So no matter how you try and spin it, it doesn't seem to work. And I know it's kind of a more – I like your example because it's more concrete, but – <laughs> Well, this is pretty amazing. No, but you're right. Um, so, it, yeah, it, it can exist. And it's always that looking for something outside of it and it doesn't have it. Mm -hmm. So it can exist. All right. So what happens at the end of stage two, once we realize that a universe that's composed of only contingent beings cannot exist. And then we realize that, you know, now we bring ourselves back to the real world. And, you know, it's you and me. It's, it's the audience, right? There is a world that exists around us. So since, contingent th there are since there are some contingent things, and we know that, right? New babies and watching, you know, um, grandparents pass away, which is sad, of course. Mm -hmm. um, the only way to explain how those contingent beings actually exist, and they do because we're here to talk about it, uh, there must be at least one necessary being. Something that uh, doesn't rely on... Uh, something else to give it existence. Any, so any questions at that conclusion? Yeah, no, I think um, I like the way that you're breaking this up because um, it's, it's, it, it's easy to follow along, I think, uh, with, with this presentation. Um, I guess the, the only thing that I might want to... By the way, I'm not f fully finished. There's more to the third way, but go ahead. Oh, yeah, I know. I know we're about to dive even deeper here because at this point, I mean, shoot, somebody might think that, that necessary being is... It, it doesn't have anything to do with God per se right now. You might think that that's an electron, that electrons are necessary, right? Correct? So, well, they certainly might think it's, it's some f uh, thing in nature that not necessarily God, that's for sure. Yeah, so just because we're arguing for a necessary being at this stage does not necessarily mean we're arguing for God's existence. We're just trying to explain how there can be any contingent reality at all instead of nothing, correct? Right. We're going from the fact that we know that there are contingent things and that they actually exist. We see them. And actually, I'm a contingent being, and so are you. We have to try to explain, well, how could they exist? And once we realize that a world of only contingent beings can't exist, then we realize we need at least one necessary being to explain the actual contingent beings like you and I that we experience every day. Great. Awesome. I think we're good. Okay. So now the next stage. Now we're going to move to stage three. Let me take a sip of water here. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, it turns out, you know, these philosophical arguments, they can get pretty nuanced because a good philosophical argument tries to account for a lot of the objections and also it, it tries to account for um, other moves that can be made. So what Aquinas will do in the second part of the third way, which I'm calling stage three, is he will talk about how there's two ways that a thing can be necessary, you know, a necessary being. And it's going to be, it could either be necessary through another or it can be necessary through itself. So I like to use an example to make this clear because one of the, let me give your audience one of the big tricks to, to teaching, if any of them are teachers in any capacity. The way the human intellect works is we abstract out things all the time. 
if you just try to describe a dog and a cat, some people will get it, of course. But if you actually bring them to a house that has a dog and a cat and you watch them run around and act differently, your mind will start to abstract out. Oh, okay, I see it. The cat's aloof and this dog doesn't stop attacking me. And, you know, there's all these also <laughs> dog is barking and the cat's meowing, you know. So the way to really do philosophy or any kind of teaching is to give a lot of examples. So here's the example I like to use to illustrate the, the difference between a being that's necessary through itself versus necessary through another. Okay. Imagine, well, you don't have to imagine. Think of the sun that gives us light every morning, right? Now, of course, scientists have told us that the, the sun, you know, it didn't always exist. It came into being sometime after the Big Bang. I don't know exactly when. And of course, it will eventually burn out in supernova one day. But for purposes of a thought experiment, let's just pretend the sun always existed and it always will exist. Okay? So it's a necessary being. Uh, it never came into being and it's not dependent on any causes uh, at all for its existence. This is just a thought experiment. We're just trying to see where this leads. Well, okay, so the sun always exists. It's a necessary being. Well, light, photons, but let's just think of light. Light is always coming out of the sun as well. So the light always existed and it always will exist. But notice the difference. The light, although it's a necessary being, is still dependent on the sun, which produces the light. So it's necessary through another. If you could somehow destroy the sun, you'd also destroy the light. So the light is dependent on the sun. So that's the difference between a being that's necessary through another and a being that's necessary through itself. In this example, the sun has its necessity within itself. It's not dependent on anything at all for its existence, whereas the light is dependent on the sun for its existence. Does that make sense? It does, but the light is still necessary in the sense that the sun cannot not produce light. Well, it's necessary in the sense that it always was and always will be because the sun is always producing it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get any questions about, is it a free choice by the yeah, sun? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm hinting at, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. I don't want to, that's yeah, too much. Yeah, that's yeah. A good point. <laughs> okay, so we realize that in stage two, in order for the contingent beings around us that we know to exist, in order for them to actually exist, uh, there has to be at least one necessary being. And then in stage three, we realize, well, it could be necessary through another or it could be necessary through itself. And that sets up another thought experiment now. Could it be that the only kinds of necessary being are necessary through another? And the answer would be no. Because to be necessary through another is to depend on something outside of yourself. And then if that thing is necessary through another, well, it depends on something outside of itself. And this, could, this would go on for an infinite regress and it would never be resolved. Mm -hmm. So what Aquinas does in stage, uh, what I'm calling stage three, is to say that, no, look, if there are any necessary beings that are necessary through another, somewhere in the universe, there has to be something, at least one thing, that's necessary through itself, that's completely self-sufficient, that doesn't depend on anything for its existence. And that's the big conclusion at the end of stage three. So any questions about that? Yeah, no, um, I think that's a, a really helpful illustration. Um, because I, that's kind of unique to Aquinas's presentation of the idea of, of necessary through another. And a lot of the more modern arguments from contingency or conditioned reality, you, you often don't get that distinction. But I think it is relevant. I think it is relevant and, and helpful to have that in, in, um, in this stage of the argument. Um, because well, perhaps, some, later, perhaps later on we could talk about how it might be the case that some aspects of the physical universe are actually necessary through another, through God. So, they, so you know, this, this gets into interesting discussions like, um, you know, matter can neither be created nor destroyed, we say in science. So of course, we're talking about human beings. Human beings can't create or destroy matter. But if that's true, if there's a sense in which matter always will be, um, you know, that would be necessary through another, though, I would argue, through God. And we mm -hmm. can get into that later. But, and, but, um, but, the, but the key is it's, it's still, I think the key word here is dependency. Even if it's necessary through another, its right. necessity is still dependent on. And then one right. could argue if that is a type of contingency or not. I don't know if that's... You, you, yeah, I know. It gets, it gets a little complicated with that. But, let's, but the, the key takeaway is the way you put it. You put it well. It's still dependent on another. Mm -hmm. Even though it's always there, it's still dependent on another. And that's enough for it not to be the most foundational thing in, in, in reality. Mm. You know, the most foundational thing in reality is going to be something that's necessary through itself because it's not dependent on anything in any way. 
And that's what uh, we reach in stage three. We, we realize there must be at least one being that's necessary through itself. And then in stage four, what's going, this is my favorite. I'm getting close to my favorite part now because we still haven't gotten to God yet, like you said. Mm-hmm. All we know right now is that there has to be at least one being that's necessary through itself. But maybe one thing that's unresolved right now is maybe there could be multiple beings that are necessary through themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe there's, you know, if you, if you even wanted to postulate that this thing is God, maybe there's 10 gods, right? But the next stage, stage four is, uh, well, actually, uh, I'm sorry, stage five. I, I skipped the stage. Stage five, I'm going to show you how, no, that's impossible. There can only be one reality. Yes, yeah, but... But, but at least at this point, okay, maybe there's a committee of, of gods. And if there's a committee of gods, well, that explains the camel, right? Because clearly that looks like it was made by a committee. So it's not, well, it's not out of the question at this point. <laughs> I thought you were going to go to the platypus or something. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we still haven't shown that this thing is intelligent yet. Uh, so, I, you know, philosophers have to be very humble because getting to God takes a lot of steps. I'm I'm just trying to get us to a necessary being right now. Yeah. And, and, and I just would want to emphasize that, you know, you know, no matter where you're coming, like this, like this is something that not only could an atheist agree on, it's something that many atheists do agree on to this step. Some of the smartest atheists agree on the idea of a necessary being. They just right. would, would they argue would whether or not that's God or not. Or something. Right. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So at the end of stage three, we realize that there has to be at least one being that's necessary through itself. Now, stage four. This one is a little complicated, but I'm going to do my best to make it clear. <clears throat> so, hmm, give me one sec. All right. We got to take a little step back before we can do the stage four. I want you to think about, you know, when you went to the zoo when you were a kid, right? When I went to the zoo, you know, you see things that you... I mean, if you watch a lot of TV, maybe you've seen zebras and things like that. But if, if you don't watch a lot of TV when you're a kid, you know, you see animals and birds and colorful things and peacocks, things that you've never seen before. And it's like, what is that? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and there's a conceptual distinction between what we call essence or nature, you know, being a bird, being a, an animal, a crocodile, whatever, and existence. The fact that it actually is there and it, and if there weren't a wall, it could lunge at me and maybe attack me, right? Mm-hmm. So we have this conceptual distinction between essence and existence. And if we focus on the essence of something, the kind of being it is, like let's, let's take something like a phoenix. This is the example Aquinas gives in one of his books, right? What's a phoenix? I mean, if you've seen the Harry Potter movies, you know, it's also in classical Greek mythology. It's, it's a bird that supposedly when it, burns up in fire it's reborn from its own ashes so it's like a kind of magical bird or something like that Mm -hmm. or if you rather think of something like a pegasus a horse with wings you can do that the point is when you focus on the conceptual content of the kind of thing these things are the essence right a flying horse is a horse with wings just by focusing on the essence what it is you don't actually know anything about its existence. Like, for example, is it possible that there's a planet somewhere in this universe where there is a horse with wings? I don't know. Maybe. I don't think it would be able to fly. They're too heavy. But maybe it has wings and they're just useless, kind of like chickens have wings, but they don't really fly. (laughs) The point is, though, from knowing the essence, what it is, the kind of being that it is, the fact that it's an animal or a bird or whatever, doesn't tell you whether or not it actually exists somewhere. So as, as young people and as young philosophers, we have this conceptual distinction between essence and existence. And we sort of have a suspicion that it's more than just a conceptual distinction, that it's a real distinction, mm-hmm. that essence and existence are not identical in reality. Okay? Now, I mention all of this because in stage four, now we're going to contemplate this being that's necessary through itself. Right? And we're going to say, could it be possible that its essence, what it is, and its existence, the fact that it exists, could those be separate? Could they be really distinct? Could there be a a separation between those two? And the answer is no. Because if there were a real distinction, a real difference between the essence of a necessary 
being, meaning a being that's necessary through itself and its existence, well, then it would need a cause because that would mean its existence, its essence had to acquire existence. The only way that something would not need a cause of its existence is if its, ex- if its essence is identical to its existence. In other words, it is existence itself. So the only way that something could be totally self-sufficient, necessary through itself, it turns out, is if its essence is identical to its existence, if they're one and the same. And so we realize in stage four that the, um, this being that we're talking about that's necessary through itself has to be pure being or just existence. Now, that's a wallop, I know. So any questions on that? Or- <laughs> it, is, it is a wallop, but I think it's an, an important step in, in this argument. Um, so it's, it's probably worth spending a, a little bit of time on. Um, one thing that actually really struck me just on my own kind of personal journey um, was when I, when I first read this line of argumentation and it made sense to me, I always remember the, the, you know, the, the biblical data that supports this. You know, when, when Moses asks God what his name is, you know, I, I am who I am. I, you know, God is to be, to be. And I always thought like, wow, that's, that's incredible that these things we can arrive at through reason kind of match up with the Judeo-Christian conception of, of God as the ground or the foundation of all being. He's not just like one, he's not just one item within existence. He is just the very act of existence itself. And that just like, you know, blew my mind when I first got there to, to see that correspondence. Um, but, but no, I, I mean, and this is, this is, this is one of, I, I really like how you're kind of, because the cool thing about contingency type arguments that I've realized is there's actually many paths you can take to establish the foundation as God. But I really like this one that, you know, between the real distinction between essence and existence, um, because that helps to kind of shave off, as we'll see, any possible arbitrary limits or boundaries to who and what God is. And it, and it, it eliminates possibilities, especially material possibilities as the foundation. So maybe I'm getting too far ahead of myself, but. Um, no, actually you raised something excellent. Um, I can't remember the exact word, but it, po- it made something pop into my mind. I, w- I want to clarify here. So this is now we've reached a point where we're getting very abstract because I, and I understand that this is tough stuff, but, but you, you made me think of something that's good. So let me say this to your audience. So, Essence is what something is, the kind of being that it is, right? Is it a bird? Is it a cow? Is it a horse? But what I want you, everybody to think about is essence is always a limiting factor. Take human beings, right? We're mammals. We're intelligent. It's great to be a human being, but we, we can't fly in the air like the birds. That's one of the limitations of human nature. We can't breathe underwater. We don't have gills like the fish. Uh, and there's a lot of things that we can't do because our essence limits us, right? So essence is always a limiting factor. And the idea with this being that's necessary through itself is, to, well, there's two things going on here. One, if its, if its essence is its existence, if they're identical, then there's nothing limiting this existence. It's pure existence. It's infinite. There's no limitations. That's number one. And number two, another reason to realize why essence can't be different from existence in this necessary being is because anytime you have two different realities, you have a kind of composition and, and, and it means it's composed of two things. And that means we need a cause to join them. So the example I like to give is take a painting to, to have a painting. You need a canvas and then you got to put paint on it. So you have two different realities and anything that's composed of two different realities requires in this case, a painter to join them. So if essence and existence were really different in this necessary being through itself, well, then it would, it would require a cause. It would be dependent on something outside of itself and it really wouldn't be necessary through itself. It really wouldn't be self-sufficient. So that doesn't work. We realize in stage four, as I'm laying it out, that this thing that's necessary through itself must be existence itself, pure being. And as you said, the great I am that Moses uh, talks about in Exodus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, awesome. And uh, this was something that took me a while to, to kind of wrestle with and, and grapple with, but it was really powerful once I felt that I got at the idea of limits or restrictions and boundaries and how they exclude to the extent that, you know, if you think it's a proton, that's, that's a problem because protons exclude electrons. There can't be proton electrons, right? So if, if the act of existence just was existing as a proton, then there couldn't be anything like electrons. But there are electrons. So whatever this act of existing through itself is, it must transcend those limits and boundaries until you really get to something that is just absolutely 
Simple. Well, you know, that there actually is a profound point in there. And I would actually say that that's related to exemplar causality. And maybe we could talk more about that at the end. But believe it or not, we don't need that in the third way just yet. <laughs> cool. Well, if we can skip the, the, the really difficult, abstract stuff, even better. <laughs> okay, no problem. No, th- th- there is a great point there. And I'll, I'll try to return to it later. Mm-hmm. So we now have finished stage four. We realize that in order, f- and, and this is a recapitulation. We, we started off this whole crazy thing by realizing that in the world that we live in, whether it's in New York or Wisconsin or California or wherever, that there are contingent beings, and actually I'm one of them and you're one of them, uh, and we're trying to explain how could these contingent beings exist, and we realize that, you know, it can't just be a universe of only contingent beings, it has to be at least one necessary being. And then we realize that, you know, a, a being can be necessary either through another or through itself, and then we realize, well, there has to be at least one being that's necessary through itself, And then we realize that in this being that's necessary through itself, that its essence and existence must be identical, which means it's just pure existence or pure being, right? And now the stage five is going to be the, we're going to make the argument that there can be only one reality. This is like an argument for monotheism in a way. There can be only one reality, only one God that is being itself. Mm -hmm. So this is also a difficult argument, but maybe in some ways a little easier than the previous. So here's how it goes. All right. So we're, 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 we're contemplating something that's pure being, or pure existence. It's something that's not limited by an essence. Like not, it's not a bird. It's not a cat. It's not a human. It's just pure existence, pure being. And I, I realize that that's hard to contemplate, but you, you can sort of get there by realizing the absurdities if, if it weren't pure being. Okay. Now, why can there be only one of these realities? Okay, so it goes like this. Suppose we wanted to have two realities that are pure being. Let's give them names. And this is just for fun. Like, you know, Ted and Mary, right? So Ted's a pure being and Mary's pure being. Can we have two things or two realities that are pure being? And the answer is no. It goes like this. In order for Ted to be different than Mary, or in order for pure being A to be different from pure being B, one of them has to have a property or something that the other does not have. In other words, one of them has to have something that distinguishes it from the other. Because if they have every property identical, they'd be one and the same being. Mm -hmm. However, if one of them has a property that the other doesn't have, well, then the one with the property is not pure being. It's being plus this property. It's actually a composition of two things, and therefore it needs a cause, and it can't be pure being. Now, let me, let me use some examples to make this clear. If one of them was pure being plus a form, then it would kind of be like an angel. That's what an angel is. It's a form. It's a pure intellect, some immaterial form plus existence. It's not but like it's- a chubby little toddler with wings. <laughs> Cherubs, yeah. That's like Hollywood and, and art world's uh, representation. <laughs> and then uh, if it were pure being plus some matter, well, now it would be like a, a material thing. Not quite like a rock, but it, it would be a material being. And it wouldn't be pure being anymore. It would be being plus matter. And again, anything that's composed of two different realities, like the paint and the canvas, needs a cause. So it wouldn't be necessary through itself. So it turns out that there can only be one thing that's pure being. Now, again, this is a very difficult argument. I don't know if I laid it out clearly enough. Any comments or questions on no, that? No, I, mean, I think you made it. I mean, I actually think this is one of the easiest parts of the argument because once you have the idea of essence and existence, then you would have to think, okay, for, for there to be more than one pure act of existence through itself, more than one pure necessary reality or unconditioned reality or whatever you call it, there would have to be some type of differentiating feature. But as soon as you have a differentiating feature – you then have a composite ent- entity that, that needs an explanation for how this act of existence acquired that essence. And then you're just right back <laughs> to where we started again. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. So the beauty now at, at, that we've reached at the end of stage five is that there can only be one being that's necessary through itself because that being must be pure being and it's impossible for there to be more than one pure being. So. At the end of these five stages, if we add up everything we've done, what we realize is that there is one and only one reality that's pure being and on which everything else that exists 
is dependent for its existence. This is starting, this is very suspicious because it's starting to sound a lot like the Judeo-Christian conception of God. God is the, the source of the existence of all things, the creator. So we could leave it there. There's some other things I could talk about, but uh, that's, where, uh, that's where the third way goes when you take it to its full extension. And I think it's a very powerful argument. And by the way, nothing in chemistry or biology or physics could ever debunk this because they don't study existence. Mm -hmm. Biology studies living systems, which are physical. Chemistry studies physical chemicals and their changes and their, their bonds and things like that. And physics studies physical reality, but it doesn't get into the question of why does anything exist at all? It's yeah. just not what it does. Why is there any physical reality to begin with? That's, that's right. what we're right. asking. Well, you say, why does anything exist at all? You can say, yeah, well, why does the physical reality exist at all? Why is there anything, period? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and, and this natural sciences are great. Don't get me wrong. I love them, but they don't, they don't deal with these deep philosophical issues about existence. It's metaphysics, the science of metaphysics. It's a philosophical science that has to deal with those things. So let me um, just throw a few more objections and questions out there. Um, no, nope, I'm sorry. I'm leaving now. Now go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, because I'm sure, you know, there's people who, who have, you know, have these in, in mind. Um, but I guess the first one would say, well, let's just, let's just be clear on what this argument isn't saying. Because the, the common cliche or the common misunderstanding is, oh, Aquinas is just saying that everything has a cause. And that's obviously fallacious because then what caused God? But I think if you've been paying even 10% attention to this conversation, it should be absolutely clear that that is not what Aquinas is saying. He's saying there exist at least some contingent realities. And to the extent that some contingent realities exist, we have to have an uncaused reality, something that in principle could not have a cause to explain them. So anything you want to expand on, on that one, because it comes up so frequently. No, that's great. So let me say two things. First of all, when I argued earlier uh, that this thing, I use the word thing, but this reality that's, it's, we're talking about a nest being that's, ne it's hard to say this, by the way. You know, I used to say necessary per se being or necessary through itself, whatever. We're talking about something that's necessary through itself. And I argued that it's pure being, right? Yep. Existence itself. Now, here's the beauty. If it is existence itself, if that's what it is, it is existence. It doesn't need a cause to give it existence because it is existence. So this actually is a, is a rational explanation why God doesn't need a cause. That's number one. So actually what's nice about this is, you know, for, for the, uh, the objector, he, he may want to say that our position's irrational, but no, it's not. It's actually beautifully rational. If it is existence itself, it doesn't need something to give it existence. It doesn't need that cause. This explains why it's rational to hold that it is uncaused. Mm -hmm. Number two, there is no line in Aquinas that I know of in Latin, in any of his 10 million words, where Aquinas ever says that everything needs a cause. So it's the, the, the objection starts off on a false footing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and clearly everything can't have a cause because we look at the totality of reality and it's, it can't be caused because there's nothing outside of it to cause it. So it's just so obviously the case that there has to be, that all of reality is some way self-sufficient that there has to be some part of reality that exists necessarily. Well, and, then, and then it's just a matter of trying to unpack what, what that layer or that foundation is. Well, it actually turns out, uh, and this is not in any way disagreeing with you, I think, but it turns out everything is caused in reality except for this one thing that is necessary to itself, this pure being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm just, I was just saying, like, looking at reality in total, whatever that is, that has to be... There has to be some part of that that is self-sufficient. Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I know you're, you're probably not meaning this, but some people might interpret what you're saying is that God is actually part of reality as if he's a part of the universe. But obviously, I think you'd hold God transcends completely yes. mm -hmm. the, right, the physical universe. Right. Yeah, and that's, and that's interesting and kind of a side point is people want to talk about like natural and supernatural. And I, sometimes those, those terms do more harm than good or like – Reality is just, I mean, how would, you, how would you define reality in the sense uh, of this conversation? Okay, so reality is the sum total of everything that has existence. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is um, we argued today that the being that's necessary through itself must be pure being. So it actually exists, but it doesn't have existence. Now, let me explain what that means. I'm not endorsing atheism. An essence that's distinct from its existence has existence. So, for example, a tree 
is something that has existence. It's, it's a kind of plant or something that has existence, right? And uh, a cat is a little kind of meowing mammal that has existence. But God is not an essence that has existence. No, he is existence. So the way to separate out um, God from reality, to realize that he transcends reality, is that everything in the physical universe and everything in the created order are merely essences that have in a limited way existence. But God transcends all of that because he's not an essence that has existence. No, he's existence itself. So he actually transcends the entire world. So, so one way to look at the supernatural natural distinction would be this way. Mm-hmm. You could say that um, everything that mere, merely has existence, some kind of limited essence that has existence is in the created world. And everything that is pure being, which is only God, is outside of the created world. Now, you could say then that the supernatural is to be outside of space and time uh, in some ways. That, that would get God outside of the physical universe. But then there's the only thorny question becomes with, and I know this is speculative for many people in the audience, the angels. The angels are just a fancy word for, is it possible that God created some non-material beings? I guess you could think of ghosts or just pure intelligences. Now, they would not be part of the natural world because they're not physical in any way, but they would be part of the created world because they're a kind of form, a kind of intellect that has existence, where only God transcends both of those realms because he is existence. There's no distinction between his essence and his existence. Yeah. Angels, uh, first off, I I like that. And maybe we'll have to do a whole conversation on on angels sometime because they're very interesting. Um, So... uh, Okay, that's that's good. That's very helpful to to have those distinctions in hand because I know sometimes people get tripped up over just supernatural, natural. What exactly do we mean by that? I think for most people, natural is is the physical world, so there has to be some matter there. Yeah, mm-hmm. so yeah. The only, the only thing that would be uh, supernatural then would, would be the angels because they have no matter, and then of course God, who is the granddaddy of it all, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Well, philosophy, if nothing else, is the discipline of making distinctions, right? Oh, yes. Robert Stokolowski, who's a famous Catholic priest, uh, I think he retired now, but he, he taught at the Catholic University of America for many years. He has a great article. I'm going to try to get it and send it to you and about how the, the almost the, uh, what philosophy does is to make distinctions. I'll get you that article. I think oh, that, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to, love to read it. Um, do you have time for a few more? Um, okay. So say somebody wants to, and this is another uh, common chestnut that will come up. Um, okay, great. Dr. Delfino. That's, that's, that's really wonderful what you just said. Um, but you know what, that doesn't, that doesn't prove that the God of Christianity is true. That doesn't mean that this God gives a hoot about you. So what are you getting on about? (laughs) Okay. Well, you know, that's a big discussion. Let me see if I could just make a few quick remarks. Well, I guess the first thing I would say, if I can jump in real quick is like, great. So what? We've at least proved atheism false. So now we can just have another conversation. <laughs> well, I mean, um, let, let, let me be the devil's advocate here, though. So we've proven that there's uh, one necessary being that is pure being and that everything that exists is dependent on for its existence. That would be maybe a kind of theism, but we haven't shown it's intelligent yet. and We haven't shown that it's loving yet. So maybe it's an unsatisfying theism. Or what would you respond to that? Well, I would say... Let's let's like take an accounting of the ground that we've made and appreciate that first off, right? We've we've established because That's I think a good point, yeah, yeah. I think like this is not in like even if we haven't gotten all the way to the God of Christianity or Judaism or any religion, I think that we can take a moment and say we've got we've come a significant ways here. I mean, we've established that there has to be a necessary ground of all being that actualizes all potentialities, whose essences, and these are not insignificant conclusions by any means. So I think we can just sit here and just, uh, you know, maybe uh, agree on at least that much. And then we can, we can say, sure. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't gotten so far as to show that this, this God loves me or wants to know me personally, but that doesn't mean we haven't gotten anywhere. (laughs) No, that, no, that's absolutely true. That's a good point. So here's what popped into my mind as I was thinking about this objection you've raised. So earlier we talked about how nothingness can't cause anything because I mean, this is a funny way of putting it, but to be nothingness is to lack all causal power, to lack everything. Actually, nothingness cannot be. It's the absence of being. It's, it's, it's nothing. So when something causes something else, the cause has to have in some way what it gives to the effect. Because if the cause doesn't possess what it gives to the effect, 
well, then the effect would come from nothing again, which is absurd. Mm -hmm. So what we realize is, and now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing this a little quickly just to give a taste to the audience of how a longer argument would be. Once we realize that everything that exists, all of these things that we see around us, all these contingent beings, they all are dependent for their existence on this one pure being. Well, any perfections, any good things that we notice in our life, like the fact that humans are intelligent and that there's beauty in the world, all these perfections, all these good things have to, in some sense, exist in the cause of them because otherwise the cause couldn't give them give intelligence, for example, to humans and other things. So this is more of a fourth way argument. Um, but, and by the way, I, I discussed this in a book I wrote with Matt Frad. I, I don't know if I could plug the book. Maybe. Oh, of course. Yeah. The yeah, Socratic dialogue, dialogue book. It's great. I'm going to, I'm going to link that into show notes and I highly recommend everybody grabs a copy and we'll talk more about that at the end for sure. Okay, sure. Thanks. Yeah. It's called does God exist? The Socratic dialogue on the five ways. And the idea is that um, if, if we can show that, you know, everything is dependent on God for their existence, um, that God has to have within his causal power um, intelligence and, and other good perfections. Otherwise, he couldn't give them to the things that he causes. So if that's true, that means anytime you see a, a substantial, important perfection, God has it in a higher, perfect way. So humans are obviously intelligent. We, we make arguments with each other. We, are, we, we go through all, you know, we, we produce technology and science. So in some sense, God must be intelligent, but in a higher, perfect way. Um, so that, can, that kind of fourth way uh, reasoning can get us to the idea that God is intelligent. And then to give one last little insight with the third way, think about this. God is giving you your existence. Giving you existence is a good thing. You can't enjoy anything in life, whether it's the beauty of a sunset or the love of a friendship or the laughter of a child, if you don't exist. So he's giving this to you. And, and because he's necessary through himself, completely self-sufficient, as the third way shows, he doesn't have to give uh, existence to anything. It's not like he's lonely and needs help. That would be a kind of dependency. No, he's self-sufficient. So the fact that he's giving you existence means he's giving you something good, something beautiful. And if he's giving you something good and beautiful, that means he loves you because when we love people, we do good things for them. So, I mean, this is a very compressed, you know, quick little taste of it, but I think a good argument can be made that God is both intelligent and he's loving. And that, I think, would undercut the objection that this is not the Christian idea of God because if there's two big features of the Christian idea of God is that uh, in addition, of course, to being I am who am, the, 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 prime, the being itself, he's also intelligent and loving, and he invites us to a relationship with him. And uh, so that, I think, would undercut the objection. Yeah, I think, I think that's really good. And this idea of the principle of proportionate causality, as it's called, right? Is, ah, you've uh, been reading Ed Fazer. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, I try to do my homework, right? Is that whatever is in the, and you stated it brilliantly, whatever, and again, this is another principle that all of science presupposes, right? Because otherwise you would have to think that the project of trying to trace back cause and effect would essentially be useless if things could just be in the effect that weren't in some way in the cause, right? Because then it would just be popping out of nothing. And then well, what, what are we trying to investigate, right? Absolutely. And if, and if God is the power behind all powers, so to speak, right? He, he's the fulfillment of all rea the, the conditions of all, any actual or possible reality. He, and knowledge is a power, uh, existence, all these things, we can trace them back to their source and ultimate foundation in God. So it's really, it's not that this argument doesn't show us these things. It's just that we just need to continue this line of argument a little bit further. Absolutely. In fact, one of the things I've learned, and, and I'm not blaming people for this, but look, we have a natural desire, a natural curiosity to really want to understand and, and answer these, these deep questions about life and meaning and God. And, and look, all of us want shortcuts, whether it's we want six-pack abs in two weeks or we, we, we want to prove God in, in, in five minutes or two pages. But, you know, unfortunately, that's not the way life is. Uh, to, to really give philosophical arguments for God requires, I would say, like at least 50 or 100 pages if you really want to spell everything out and go very methodically and slowly. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't have patience for that. But, you know, it's like anything in life. If you want to do it well, you got to spend a lot of time on it. Yeah. And I guess the, the other thing I would say is, I, I w you know, obviously, I think we, we would admit as Aquinas himself would admit that, um, you know, reason can take us so far, 
but it, it can't it can't get us every at some point we do have to make the hop from philosophy to theology right so okay we can we can get it seems like to a monotheism but it doesn't seem like from philosophy alone we can get to the trinity no that's absolutely correct i don't think you can yeah but certainly everything we've established so far is completely compatible with and congruent with or would make reasonable the Christian theological starting point. And, and that's kind of a way that somebody once presented it to me is like, you know, theology starts from a given, right? We start from the, the revelations of Christ, if, if you're Christian, right? Uh, but right. philosophy can help get you to that given. <laughs> it can get you part of the way there. Like you said, it's not going to get you to the Trinity, but it can help a lot. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and then you can use philosophical principles to test theological positions for coherence, co- consistency, and things like that. How do you how do you approach them? How do you blend the, or merge the two of philosophy and theology? If you're curious to hear. Oh wow, that is a big question. <laughs> okay, so how do I? Hmm. You, you can Obviously, always say we can save it for next time. <laughs> no, <laughs> so no, deal no, with no, it. <laughs> Brief uh, comments. So and maybe this will uh, spur on some other future discussions between us. So, you know, this is something I thought about for a long time because um, one of my professors, Professor Peter Redpath, and, and others have gotten to this whole big, this is another big controversy for another day, but here's a taste of it. Can there be a Christian philosophy? So, for example, obviously Aristotle was a philosopher, but he, he, was, he wasn't a member of any uh, religion. I don't think he really bought into the, uh, you know, Zeus and, and the pagan religions of his day. But he was, you know, he was just trying, philosophy operates by operating in the rational mode of, of thinking. You know, we, we rely on our natural knowledge, you know, sensation, abstraction, knowing that things exist. And we try to make ra- purely rational arguments that don't depend on revelation or the Bible to establish our conclusions. But here's the funny thing, and I got this from Peter Redpath. When you, when you study philosophy and you try to be ultimately rational, you know, that's great. But if you live your life as a Christian and you are receiving God's grace and grace does illumine the intellect, you almost can't help but kind of live in a theological mode. Now, a theological mode doesn't mean that you can't produce purely rational arguments anymore, but it means that that's not all that's within you, that the grace and the revelation also help you to think in other ways. So it's almost as if, you know, the higher contains the lower. Everything that was good in philosophy is still good in theology, but the grace and the revelation take it even more and higher. So in some ways, I consider myself a sort of theologian because I'm getting the grace and all that. Now, I'm not trained in theology like a scripture scholar or I have PhDs in it or a doctoral degrees in it, but living the Christian life, praying to God, receiving the grace, it does elevate you. It elevates everyone. And mm-hmm. so you're no longer like a mere pagan philosopher. No, you're, you're a philosopher plus this other amazing stuff. So I don't know if that answers your question. But. It does. No, I like that. I think that's really helpful um, because I know Aquinas considered you know, theology to be the queen of the sciences, right? Well, and it is. It, it kind of incorporates philosophy within it. Mm-hmm. And he called, what was it? The philosophy is the handmaiden to theology, right? That's right. Mm-hmm. That's that's really excellent, uh, Doctor Delfino. Thank you so much. This has been a fascinating discussion. Obviously, I want to have you on again very soon. But in between, give us um, give us the the lowdown, the scoop on some of your your books and projects, and where people can get their hands on on all that sort of stuff and follow what you're doing. Okay. Well, <laughs> the books on Amazon.com, the one I wrote with Matt Frad, who's a great guy, by the way. So that, that's. Does God Exist? The Socratic Dialogue in the Five Ways. And it's actually written in a fun style. It's like, it's a guy and a girl in a coffee shop. So it's written like a play. It's mm-hmm. a dialogue. And I think that's nice because it, it helps to make a lot of this technical philosophy stuff more easily understandable. Yeah. Now, it, as, it, it, mm-hmm. okay. No, I was just going to say, it, it is an incredibly accessible book, but it has great depth to it as well. So it's not just some like light, airy, fluffy thing. It's uh, you. It, uh, it's like you're talking both to people who would be in the intro to philosophy course, but at the same time, keeping in mind the, the most academically trained skeptics as well. Well, what's nice about the book is it has a part two. So the first hundred pages or so are this dialogue in the coffee shop broken, o- broken over like about two weeks. They, they talk to each other. But then the second part of the book, which is about 50 pages, has a glossary of terms where I try to explain some of the stuff in an easy to understand manner, has the summaries of the five ways, uh, and has some other material like suggested readings if people want to dive deeper. 
and it has 128 footnotes, which you don't have to read, but if you do, I reference a lot of the scholarly literature and I give certain quotations and excerpts. So actually, if a person reads the entire book, you can actually dive pretty deep into it. So that's good. Now, here's the little confession part, though. I don't have a website and I don't have a blog and I don't have a Twitter account because I'm of the older generation. I'm going to be 47 in a few weeks. And part of me is almost like, you know, I, I, I want my space. So I'm not really the greatest guy to contact. If anybody does want to email me, though, if you go to the St. John's University website, you can find me on there and email me. But here's what I'm possibly working on in the future, and then I'll, I'll let you end it on that. Oh, cool. uh, there's, yeah, please. There's two books. Yeah, there's two books I might write. Um, I say might write because caring for my two kids and doing all this other stuff, I don't know, it's hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you need time to write these things. Um, one, I'm thinking about writing a book on metaphysics itself as a science where I address some of the things we talked about today, how it's different from the natural sciences, how the natural sciences depend on metaphysics, and also how this whole thing works. How does uh, metaphysics study existence, for example? Because that's really what it gets involved in. It studies things insofar as they exist. So I might try to write a book that's easy to understand for beginners and intermediates on that. Uh, and then the other idea I had, now none of this is official, so I don't want to get anybody's hopes up, but there's a chance um, Matt and I might write another book with AJ and Lucy in the coffee shop about the history of philosophy. So we'll see. I don't know. I've talked to him a little bit about it. He seems interested, but I don't even know if I have the time for it. He's also very busy. So mm. who knows? That could be fun. That would be a really cool, really cool book because, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm always so interested in the history of philosophy and how things go in and out of fashion. One of my favorites, I think, that gives a kind of nice little summary is um, Adler's 10 Philosophical Mistakes. Have you read that one? I have that book. It's been a while since I perused it, but yeah. Is idealism one of the mistakes in there? It, yes, it is. Yep. Mm -hmm. He's a moderate well, realist, so of course right. it is. <laughs> so real briefly, before I forget, um, so this book that we might write about the history of philosophy, why I think it would be fun and cool is we're going to show how the West lost God, how idealism uh, creeped up in modern philosophy to replace realism, and, all, and how postmodernism arose and people started losing faith and certainty and truth and things like this. So it could be, it could be really a fun book. We'll see. Well, if nothing else, maybe that could be our next conversation, if you're willing. Oh, sure. That, that sounds like fun. That'd be great. Dr. Delfino, thanks so much. Well, I had a great time. Thanks for having me, Pat. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.